in pursuing flow and in running around the world and you know training people and in, in what we've learned and, and things along those lines we essentially stumbled on a four trillion dollar underground revolution in people hacking states of consciousness to improve massively improve performance and flow is one non-ordinary state of consciousness just sort of the technical term for what these things altered state non-ordinary state and you know it was a very strange thing uh just at a personal level to be in fortune 100 companies to be on wall street to be wherever we were training people in the use of an altered state right that that in itself to me personally right <laughs> being with us started at, at where we are now um that was a big jump that was pretty crazy and and yet everywhere we went it didn't matter if we were working with the navy seals if we were working with google if we were working you know with sterling partners it's across the board to wherever we were people would come up to us after the presentation say okay this flow stuff is amazing this is great but you know we met wall street traders who are zapping their brains with electrodes to alter their consciousness and you know improve high-speed decision making before they went onto the trading floor we right. met teams of engineers teams of engineers at fortune 100 companies who were secretly microdosing with lsd at work as a team to improve creativity and team performance we met people going to tantric sex workshops you know soccer moms with yoga practices you know times you know 300 the dave asprey neurohacking biohacking crowd and all these disparate groups of people kept coming up to us saying we're doing this we're doing this we're doing this everybody's essentially doing the same thing we are trying to change the channel on normal waking state consciousness. We're trying to turn off the self, the voice in our head, and access what seems to be pretty consistently a higher level of information, inspiration, intuition, which is what comes with these states of consciousness. And it's going on kind of everywhere in all these disparate tribes. Most of these tribes aren't even talking to each other. So let's just take it. Look, when we talk about non-ordinary states, what exactly? Like, we mean there's mystical and meditative states, contemplative states, flow states, awe, um, endurance states, uh, psychedelic states, things like that. So let's just take flow, psychedelics, and meditation, right? For the past hundred years, the tribes of people who were pursuing these states, wildly different, right? Meditation was about seekers and saints and that sort of thing. Flow was for action sport athletes and artists, and psychedelics were for hippies and ravers. And Oftentimes, these people didn't even know each other. They didn't talk to each other. Totally three different groups. But it turns out, if you look under the hood neurobiologically, and this is the other thing that we've sort of discovered, they're really the same thing. When we were trying to track down kind of what is the science of flow and sort of organize it all in one place and figure it out, but to make a map of you know, non-ordinary states of consciousness, this ended up being something over Rosetta Stone. And we started to realize that all these disparate states which look really different. Somebody having an out-of-body experience is very, very different from somebody practicing yoga. is very different from a Wall Street trader zapping their brains with electrodes. Seemingly, under the surface, they're all actually doing the exact same thing for the brain. They're de so, just, so, just, uh, so just on that point, the f they're all different groups that are actually doing it for totally different reasons. Some are doing it for high performance. Some are doing it to feel good. So uh, what do you think it is that the, just the concept of flow and and, and for everyone who's watching, because we talk a lot about flow from the point of view of doing uh, what you love best, doing what you do best, uh, doing it in a way which is most meaningful, all those different elements which kind of link them together. What did you find around that whole uh, area of what it is within humans that actually make them gravitate towards flow or want to achieve that flow in the first place? So it's a great question. And uh, the answer is it's not just humans. And that's the place you got to start. So yeah. 10 to 15 years, perhaps you saw this. Uh, there's a, there was a cameraman, a, a national, an Emmy award-winning filmmaker named John Downer, set up a bunch of cameras off the coast of South Africa, underwater right. cameras. He had like cameras disguised as turtles and fish and robots. It's sort of like what the CIA would have done if they ever wanted to invade the Republic of Starkist, right? Yeah. And he's hoping to get footage of dolphins in their natural environment, and okay. he does. He potted off and comes along. They pick up a puffer fish off the bottom of the ocean floor, chew on it a little bit, and sort of spit it, throw it toward the next dolphin who catches it, does the same, until the puffer fish releases its nerve toxin, right, which is fatal in high doses. 
but in low doses for dolphins, it alters consciousness, it kicks them into a trance state. In the footage, they're like on the surface of the ocean, there's snouts sticking out, big smiles on their faces, high as kites. And the footage went viral, it, it was all over the place, and people were like, oh my God, this is crazy, we've never seen anything like it, dolphins getting high, puff, puff, pass, has a whole new meaning, right? The headlines had a blast, but turns out when we look, and a lot of scientists have looked over the past 10 years, pretty much every mammal and self, most birds have found a way to alter their consciousness one way or another. We see this with small children, they hyperventilate, they roll down hills, they spin in circles. You have, you know, goats gobbling magic mushrooms, elephants get drunk, um, the baboons use iboga, jaguars use ayahuasca, the list goes on and on and on. And the question has been, what the hell's going on? Why is this? Why, like intoxication, just like in humans, it's dangerous for animals, right? You've got carcasses of drunken birds, litter highways, right? They get into some fermented bog water, drink up, and you know, they're flying into car windows. There's a downside to this intoxication. What is it? And what researchers have discovered is that all animals, especially humans, get stuck in ruts. They can't problem solve their way out of it. And they can't get raise up their consciousness to a high enough level to see past the problem. So we seek out ways to alter our consciousness because it is a depatterning agent. It promotes lateral thinking. It helps us solve problems creatively. Right, and this is in all species. It's fundamental. In fact, Ronald Kessiegel, who's at UCLA, who did a lot of this foundational work, argues that the urge towards intoxication functions so strongly in humans that it acts like a fourth drive, meaning it's as powerful as our drive for food, shelter, and sex. So we are all actually propelled in this direction. If what you've heard on Flow Research Collective Radio has been helpful, Please consider doing us a solid and leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to this. Reviews help us connect to a wider audience so we can get these peak performance principles out to more people. Music